Dave Baldwin, thank you very much for your, your time speaking to us today on HCTV. Um, it's been a historic week for the club with yourself installed as, as managing director. That's obviously no surprise to you with everything that's been going on behind the scenes recently. How has it been for you? Uh, it certainly accelerated fairly quickly. Um, obviously, I've been here in the background of the club for the last uh, six months, operating two days a week, uh, principally looking at the stadium project and obviously the transfer of the shares to Dean from, from Phil. But uh, yeah, this situation accelerated quite quickly in the last seven days and, and Dean approached me and asked me if I was prepared to assist in stepping up into the role. Uh, clearly it's a role that I fulfilled for a number of years um, at other clubs. Um, and, and in fairness, I think it's given you know, the circumstances in which Dean needed to take a back seat. It was something I was happy to step into the breach. I think it's important that continuity is maintained and I think it's, it's what the club deserves. Before we get into to specifics around the, the current situation regarding the club, uh, could you just briefly run us through your career to date? Uh, fans will likely know your name from Bradford City or Burnley, for example. Yeah, so you know, I came into football at executive level in 2007. Um, Bradford were fairly recently out of an administration, so t tough financial times at Bradford, actually, in, in just being relegated to League Two. So I was there from a period from 2007 to 2014, firstly as the director of operations, which was a bit more hands-on around the physical day-to-day -day, and then into the CEO role, which added more strategic roles to the, to the club uh, duties. Uh, and within that time, we, uh, we achieved a promotion from League Two to League One via the playoffs. And uh, we got to uh, a Carabao Cup final, uh, sorry, a Capital One Cup final, as it was known then, Carabao Cup under the current sponsorship, yeah. um, as well as a decent FA Cup run. Probably people remember the, the time when we played Chelsea away and came from 2-0 down to beat them 4-2. So good times there. Um, I'm local to the area. So that was my my journey at Bradford. Um, I was then approached by Burnley to, to, to move to the club there and I took up the reign. I actually went in in November 14, which was their first season in the Premier League in a number of years. Um, they were relegated that season and I was asked to become the CEO. And it, it was almost a bit of pre-planning uh, when they stepped into the Championship. Um, and my role there was obviously the first year. But we, we, we got the planning permission and developed a training ground. We were promoted at the first season back in the Championship, back to the Premier League, and we stayed in the Premier League for the full duration of my tenure. And then I left in uh, the summer of 2020. And then since then, just to expand probably further on that, I've, uh, I did a, ten a short tenure at the EFL as Chief Executive. I have to admit, um, I'm a football club man and that is very much a political landscape working in, in the EFL, but it was important. That, so I went in there and the biggest duty is when I accepted the job, it was pre-COVID. As I arrived, we were in COVID and had to deal with some very challenging issues around keeping clubs afloat and, 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 and actually proud of some of the decisions that we were able to do around protecting the League One and League Two clubs by bringing the league to an end quicker, uh, getting the funding rescue packages via the Premier League and then getting the season back up and running through the, the, the COVID protocols. Um, but that was, a, that was a tough entity. And the, big, the thing I found the hardest in that role was that actually you didn't have a game on a Saturday that meant something in, in terms of when you're in a club, you live for the game, that, 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 that come, the next game that comes around, whether it be the Saturday game, the Tuesday night game, and three points is about everything, you know, and, and you, you, the emotions are elation, frustration, absolute disappointment, but then you go again the next week. When you're responsible for 72 clubs under a governance capacity, you don't get that same feeling. It, it's a bit more bureaucratic. Um, so when I left the EFL, I, I've, I've consulted for a number of clubs in the background, um, and then that's how the opportunity came along initially to help Dean on a on a, an ad hoc two-day basis to then stepping up to the situation today so back at the coal face of uh, running a football club day to day so excellent none of this is new to you i would hope not and i think you know that's probably ho hopefully give some comfort to the supporters and i and i, I you know supporters through social media message boards they interact with each other burnley fans i'm sure will be having communication with huddersfield fans on we'll know them from local pubs because that you know the closeness of the three areas same with bradford fans and uh, in fairness i have to admit when i went to burnley you know, I was less known in terms of football circles leaving from Bradford to go to Burnley and, and the fans on leaving Bradford were fantastic in some of their comments that Burnley fans were asking of them on the message boards, which is it helps because it softens the, the approach of who is this person who's coming in, taking custodianship and, 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 and who's at the helm of our football club. Because, you know, we, we wear our hearts on our sleeves when it comes to be football clubs. I mean, you know, I make no excuse of me being a, a Bradford City fan and, 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 you know, I love my club as a, as a supporter. So I, I get it as how supporters will love a football club. And the most important thing you want to know 
know is you've got somebody in there who knows what they're doing, a safe pair of hands, and actually cares about your football club. And I can say, safely say, you know, I'm a Bradford fan. I cared passionately about Burnley when I was doing my job there. And I will bring the same energy to here in terms of trying to do what's best for this football club in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I think many of the immediate questions and, and concerns that the supporters or wider people might have had about the situation was, was probably answered in the statements that we put out earlier this week on our website. But if we're discussing those in a little bit more detail to allow some further peace of mind, um, firstly, something that you'd said was part of your remit previously was the, the transfer of shares from Phil Hodgkinson and Pure to, to Dean Hoyle. Could you just give us an update as to the lay of the land where that's concerned? Yeah, so there's quite a... I mean, people are always concerned that it's been a year now and why is it not yet completed? So I'll take that in two parts. The first part was when I arrived in May, actually the position that Dean had in relation to the stepping into the club was power of attorney over, over Phil's shares. So in effect, he's still the 25% shareholder, but he has the power of attorney to, to the responsibilities of running the football club on behalf of Phil's shares. There then is a transaction element, which is obviously taking the shares back from Phil, you know, doing a transactional deal from Phil back to, to Dean to put him at 100%. Now, the EFL regulations around the owners and directors tests have changed in recent years, uh, and obviously I were fortunate enough to see that from the other side as that regulatory process uh, occurred. And when you actually transfer shares, there's two elements that need to be achieved. One is you have to get FCA approval. Now, that is a, is a mandatory, usually a three-month minimum from the starting point of application, and that is the entire submission of a business plan for the next three years on the running of the football club. The same business plan has to be set out as a format to the EFL to show under the owners and directors test your sustainability model, what you intend to do. So that's occurs this season, next season and the season after. So we've had to submit to the EFL a full business plan and that business plan also then demonstrates what Dean's future funding requirements would be. And then within that, what that generates is a thing called a secure funding agreement between the owner. So the EFL then contract, they, they assess your, your submission, so they in effect audit what you're saying you're going to do for the next three years, and sh you then say what you, you feel you need to commit financially to make that happen, because let's not get away from it, Dean contributes money to this club to make it sustainable, it doesn't sustain itself by its own incomes, so therefore you, pl you plot where you intend to be with it, what that cost is, they then audit that process and then they get the new owner, because they're treating Dean exactly like they would treat a new owner coming into a club, even though he's a 25% shareholder, and then they, they give him a secure funding agreement for him to sign. Now we're actually getting, that, that process of the transfer element started from when I arrived, which was you know late April into May, and that can take usually six, six to eight months. The process prior to that, obviously before my time, it was, it was Dean was operating in stepping in and solving the immediate problem of, of Phil not able to continue with it and did it under a power of attorney of, of those shares. So it sounds a very long-winded process, but it's a necessity to the, the situation. And actually the formal transfer of the shares started in May. And it, it, the intention is for that to complete imminently. But we are still finalising the secure funding agreement, get those words out, and that is very much because our business plan is still being scrutinised by the EFL and the various questions that are asked as a result of that. So uh, that's not normal. So when Dean makes the comment, I will continue to fund the club you know, as we find the next custodian, that actually aligns with what is already been put in within a three-year business plan. So... OK. Um, that's the, the present situation of the club. You touched on the future of the club and, and the next custodian. That's something you, you touched on in your statement as well. Whose remit is it to, to find that next person? Is it yourself? Yeah, so I'll be the gatekeeper of that, that situation. And some of that will come by inward, inward inquiries. Some of that will come by networking through uh, organisations and uh, specialists that actually broker M&A deals with clubs. Interestingly, in my 18 months away from leaving the EFL in January 21 and coming here in 22 is that in my consultancy capacity, as well as advising a number of clubs around structure and around process, uh, I mentored five CEOs in the UAE Pro League, for example, on behalf of the league in, uh, between Abu Dhabi and Dubai with, with the five clubs that I, I worked with over a period of time. In addition to that, there are a number of M&A brokers who, and lawyers that have hired my services to go into clubs and do an assessment of those clubs as a due diligence process for potential buyers. 
So that, that world of M&A, mergers and acquisitions, that world of lawyers that transact that, I've actually been on the side of being a consultant for those individuals to go and assess whether a club is, is worth buying and is the price right. So where, the, where this becomes, you know, poacher becomes gamekeeper is I sit on the, on the club side of it to make sure that the club is, the structure and the detail around what somebody's buying is laid out quite clearly in, in what they call a data room, uh, the access to information to know that what they're buying meets with what the sale and purchase agreement actually states, what they call an SPA, and more importantly that actually it's the right custodian for the football club who understands what they are taking on, what it means to the local community and what their expectations, what can, can be delivered and what their capabilities of delivery are and, and, and clearly that becomes an element of a, a beauty parade of, of investors and then assessing who is right for the field time football club. And, and that I'll take I'll take the mainstay on that one in terms of actually uh, you know f the flow of information the flow of candidates that, that, that come and knock on the door and then use, use the, utilize the relevant professionals really that uh, can help you know challenge these individuals whether through the accountancy firms that we use on the audit testing and the, the legal firms so. you mentioned finding the right person I think that's probably the, the key message from what you just said there's there's obviously no time scale on that because that's not a process that can be rushed and the club isn't being left in the lurch in the, in the meantime, is it? No, we're not sitting here and going, do you know what, this is a fire sale and we need to sell, sell, sell as quickly as possible. That, and I think Dean made that clear in his comments around stepping away from that leadership element and that, but he's not stepped away from his financial, fiscal responsibilities in terms of the support of the football required, club required in order to do it. And actually that's good to protect the football club it's also good to protect the position of Dean relative to obviously he, he has historic investment in this football club to a significant sum now all of that factors into the discussion when 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 a new custodian comes along and understands you know what what they're paying to acquire the club what it's going to pay to, to run the club so you want to find the right individual there and Dean obviously is is able to have a, a, an active role in making sure the deal the deal is attractive enough to somebody to to be able to achieve their objectives so Obviously, as well as the, the football club, there are a number of assets associated to Huddersfield Town, one of which we're, we're sat in, in, in the John Smith Stadium, in the Heritage Suite here. The other is across the road on Leeds Road at the Millet Oils High Performance Complex. How do those two assets factor into this, this future of the football club? Well, I think the simple answer is, there's a bit of reverse engineering on this, but the simple answer is that a new custodian of a football club will come in with a clean bill of health and have under its jurisdiction the training ground. That will become part of the transfer of the ownership and we are working towards, we have a tri-party agreement currently on the stadium, which is between the rugby club, the council and the football club. That tri-party agreement is, is to three shareholders but two users. Uh, in effect, what we're working towards, and this is what I've been doing in the background since May, prior to sort of stepping into this new, the new role, was to actually find a way where the football club becomes the lease lead tenant on the stadium. It has the lead on the lease, and actually the rugby club will then su subsequently become a sub-tenant of, of that relationship. So those discussions are ongoing. They're not concluded. What I would say is we are making positive, constructive development on that and, and hope to be able to announce something in, in the not too distant future that will be good for the football club, uh, good for the ongoing sustainability and income generation of the, 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 the stadium. And when I talk about sustainability, I'm talking about the utilization of the stadium. I'm talking about the condition of it as well, thinking for future planning. So one person takes key responsibility and that being the lead tenant, the lead tenant being the football club uh, and has a security of tenure under that tenancy that, that is, is good for the club then to develop the facilities beyond what they are today so that's a work in progress but it's progressing well and all parties are in a, a, a positive frame of mind and we're all pulling in the same direction to deliver that outcome but what I don't want to do and I'm probably I actually feel I've said more than I would like to but, I, but in the interest of transparency is that is a, 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 a goal we're working towards which actually then sits better for a new custodian because a new custodian sits there where they step into a football club environment where they are the lead on the stadium maximize the asset maximize the the, the, the commercials minimize the running cost to make them as efficiency as possible uh, in terms of you know you're not you're not paying over the odds for things and that could you you want to be master of your own domain when you're the, the main tenant of it and that's and the training ground as well so it, it would be a good place for a new custodian to step into and it, it would become a, a very good prospect for somebody but it's got to be the right person. 
I think as, as part of that and the, the clean bill of health, I imagine that includes any existing debts that the football club might have, as, as all football clubs in this day and age tend to. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing out of the ordinary in terms of, in, especially in the Championship, you know, a little bit different in the Premier League uh, and, and lesser numbers in League One and League Two, but it's not uncommon that in the Championship that the revenues generated through central incomes from the EFL, through gate receipts, through sponsorship, do not sustain the running of a football club championship wage budget. If you had the wage budget to match your incomes, most clubs under that level go down. So the, the way that clubs actually support that is either by beneficiary ownership, owners putting money in, which is obviously something Dean has done significantly over a long period of time, um, and the other one is obviously player trading. So you, you, know, you develop assets and you, you, you sell them on for a profit. It's, it's ironic. I sold Naki Wells to, from Bradford to, to Huddersfield and I bought him to, to, from Huddersfield to Burnley. The differential between the purchase price and the sales price was an income generation for Huddersfield Town Football Club. Now, it, it's not about a fire sale of selling players. It's the balance between where, what's your business model. So one of the questions of a custodian will really be about what is their level of investment on, a, on, a, on an annual basis around what's their model to get it where... You know this club is, is is deemed sustainable, if, even if part of that sustainability is around owner investment on an, on an annual basis. Because obviously, any any anybody who comes into sport wants to achieve positive outcomes on the field. You know, it's about going out and winning football matches and getting promoted or staying in the division if you're in the Premier League. And, and that's no different to what I've done in the last 15 years. The primary objective is to create a sustainable football club and win matches and be successful. And finding that balance is, is an ongoing measuring stick. So that's important of, of the questions that you ask the next custodian as to how they balance all those things for the long-term future of the football club. It's interesting you, you bring up on-field concerns and, and player trading uh, as part of the, the short-term future of the club. It's something that Matt Fotheringham touched on in his press conference as well as Tom Lees is that the immediate concern is to stay within the Skybet Championship this season during this transitional period. But there is a, a transfer window in January as well. Yeah. How will this current situation affect what the club is able to do there? Right. I think it's safe to say that January there is likely to be some form of refresh. I, don't, I won't go into the specifics of that, but it's a very active time now to d determine how can we make this team better to avoid relegation from the Championship. So let's, number one, manage expectations. In reality now, staying in the Championship or getting to the number of points required to stay in the safety position of the Championship is the key priority. Ideally, you want to have done that before Game 46. But the reality is, as long as we can achieve that objective by game 46, staying in this league is, is an absolute priority. I'd love to be in a scenario where we turn and say, guess what, we've got to the, num the prerequisite number of points, and I think the average in the last 10 years is 47. People use that sort of uh, simulation of 50 points is, is the safe number. You want to get there as quickly as possible. But whatever happens, the priority is, the horizon is, let's stay in this division for the, for the immediacy. If that means making some refreshment around the player squad in January, that's something that is not... Discussions are ongoing on that now in terms of what could help, you know, the first team coach actually being able to improve on delivering the outcome. So, uh, yeah, I'm not... I hope that gets given an open enough answer to say, you know, there are a number of players playing now. There are a number of players that are not available to the manager due to injury. You assess that situation. There's a bit of a breathing space around the, the Qatar World Cup, which almost is like another pre-season. Uh, and then very quickly after that, I think we play three games when we get back and we're straight into an open transfer window. Let's just say we're getting on the front foot to make all the ascertains as to what is the best action to take at that moment in time, uh, which will involve an element of refresh. The, the last thing I'll ask you, Dave, is that obviously... The there is change happening now and there is further change to come in the future. But at present, it seems as if it's, it's business as usual and, and the concerns that were present last week are the, the same concerns that are present this week. Yeah, I think, I think that's why I've, I've been prepared to take on the role. I mean, my reasons for leaving you know, the EFL and, and, and obviously I had a great time at Burnley and left on a high there at a time when that club was then subsequently following my departure was, was sold on to another custodians is that actually... I take, I take pride in, in running a football club well and, and, being, and delivering a good business operation. But at the same time, you know, that balanced off with delivering results on a football pitch and whatever problem you find yourself in, surviving in a league and not getting relegated or pushing for promotion. I'll give you an example of, of what this feels very similar to. So in Burnley's season, I think it was a 16-17, we finished seventh in the Premier League, qualified for the Europa League played the 17-18 season and played six games in the Europa League qualifying over three rounds. 
absolutely created confusion in the building in terms of players starting, not starting, and we, we, ultimately we kind of lost a bit of our identity because it, it's something that was new to us. Put us in a, a situation where we were on 12 points after 19 games at Christmas, and yet we survived in the Premier League with over 40 points. The horizon had to have been adjusted a bit, but what it was, it was about calm, steady heads in a turbulent moment where ordinarily 12 points on Boxing Day puts you in a situation that you're more likely to get relegated. And actually, we didn't get relegated, and we didn't get relegated the season after. So, but what it, what it took in that building was, we use the phrase, noses pointing in the same direction. And that was the supporters, that was the manager, that was the executive team, that was the board. You know, the staff understanding that there was an absolute belief that we're all pulling in the right direction. And, and, and Sean Dyche on the football side and my, myself on the CEO side were obviously two key figures to make sure that calmness was, was maintained. Now, do we find ourselves in an ideal situation sitting bottom of the league? No, we don't. Have, have I walked this walk before? Yes. Do I think that we have the ingredients to get out of this situation? I wouldn't have taken it on if I, didn't, if I thought it was a, you know, dead and buried it is a reality. But what we need to do is, is, is create a, an environment where we're all pulling in the same direction from the stands, to the boardroom, to the training ground, to on that match day pitch, to every member of staff that works in this building. And hopefully that's the assurance that will come out from a fan's perspective that, um, and that's, that's why I took the challenge on, because I, I think it's a really good club. Just in doing those two days a week, I sort of took a real affection for what the environment of Huddersfield Town is like, that, that, that sense of community is resonated with is what I've seen at Bradford, what I've seen at Burnley, that sense of what it means to the town as well, you know, in a smaller town, again, similar to, to the Burnley situation. And actually, the, the foundations here and, and the, the work the staff have done and certainly what Dean has done as, a, as an owner. I mean, Dean as an owner, from a CEO perspective, is a, is a dream owner to work for. Now, he, he stepped into the background in terms of his position because of health, but the reality is, is that the, the club have had a good custodian here and it's important that we find the next good custodian because it, it, take, it does take a lot of energy to deliver an outcome and actually I'm glad I've had that little bit of a break from the full-time coal face of it between you know January 21 to the present day to hopefully bring the energy that's required now to deliver that outcome and outcome number one let's stay in this division outcome number two being able to get the stadium to a situation where we have better control of it and and and, and we maximize its revenues and we minimize it, its, its, its exposures to cost and that uh, option number three or option or action number three to find the right custodian to take a continuation of that on and hopefully we'll do it in such a way that it, it for any custodian coming in it's a nice tidy clean setup for them to work from that platform to move forward with Excellent. Dave, you're a, you're a busy man, so thank you very much for giving us the time. My pleasure. My pleasure.